I want to welcome everyone again. We're going to go over some uh, announcements. And uh, this is the last chance you have to make any changes to the church directory. So if you have any changes to make, uh, there is cards to fill out back there at the welcoming center. Make sure to do that. Prime Timers are meeting Wednesday, May the 1st at 9 o'clock at Famous Anthony's on 460. So remember that. And the men's breakfast is coming up on the 27th. That's this Saturday at 8 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So that's going to be a good time there. And don't forget that Sunday school is, has changed. It is starting at 9.30, and it's for all ages. And the men's Bible study at, um, on Wednesday that's, or is at 7 o'clock, and they're studying uh, 1 Peter and the women's Bible study. I think they're still uh, on prayer. And uh, that's Wednesday at 6.45. Amen. So I got... There it is. <laughs> and also we have corporate prayer on Wednesday night from 6 to 6.45. And we're continuing to pray for Alex and uh, his mom and dad, Joe Rock's mom, Bob Pratt, sister Susan, and of course Janelle Keaton. And uh, I haven't heard anything on Janelle. Does anybody know it? I know it's um, just keep them in prayer. And there's others in the bulletin. I also want to make mention that Bob Pratt's sister is going in for a procedure tomorrow to, I guess, put the port in for the uh, chemotherapy that she's going to be taking. And I um, also want to remind you of the offering boxes at the door on the, on the exits. And also to be sure to look at your bulletins for more details, everything. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, somebody had a birthday Saturday. Um, so somebody's going to start singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Jimmy. Happy birthday to you. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to... Our scripture reading is Second Peter... Uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 from the New Living Translation. And this is, in, all, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supp uh, supplement your faith with a uh, generous portion of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patience, endurance, and patient endurance with goodness, or godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All righty, with that brotherly love, take some time and shake some hands and welcome one another. We have some guests with us today, so make them feel welcome. And then pastor's coming up. Amen. All right, take one Sunday off, and here I am late to the sermon and everything else. I don't know what would happen if I stayed away longer. Hey Amen, it's good to see everybody. Thank you for the birthday witches. How many other people have a birthday in April? Anybody here? All right. How about May? Ricky, how about June? Oh, a lot. July, Barbara, August, Michael, <laughs> what's after that? September? <laughs> Sorry. All right. Todd, too? Well, you, I know your theory on that. October? All right. November? This side over here? Melissa? December? Along with Jesus, that we, well, not really, but you know. <laughs> How about January? Okay, Keith, you were waiting, weren't you? February? 
Cal, <laughs> Sheeta, March, Virginia. All right. Well, happy birthday to everybody. <laughs> See, I embarrassed all of you. <laughs> Amen. It was good to get away last week, and I appreciate it. And Pam and I went camping, and we bought a little camper about two years ago when I retired. And, uh, and uh, we've used it a couple of times. But it was really nice. We just went up, up near uh, Harrisonburg and all and went to our campground, and it was nice. I think some of you saw it on Facebook. They had a bunch of big rabbits. When we got there, I got out of the truck to sign in, and there was a big rabbit in the wood pile that they sell you the wood. And I thought, that's a cat. I mean, that's some kind of big... And it was a rabbit, and I went inside, and the lady said, oh, yeah, somebody, I forget how it got started, but somebody dropped rabbits off or something years and years ago, and you know rabbits, and now there's a lot of them, and they also get fed a lot, and, and then people bring them when they um, don't want them anymore. It's sort of a, you know, what's that called, a refuge or something? And um, so now there's hundreds, hundreds, and we have a beagle, and, and yeah. <laughs> And he was like, well, we thought he would go crazy, but that's probably, he probably don't hunt. <laughs> uh, I think when he saw those big rabbits, he was like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm not going to pick on them, you know. But it was, it was neat. I appreciated Randy coming in and bringing the word last week. He did a really good job with that. And I know they're down visiting family uh, today, and, but I just wanted to thank them for that. Um, Last time, a week before, we were talking about, in John, we're going to be in John chapter 8, we were talking about in John chapter 7, Jesus and his interaction with the religious leaders of the day there, and how it went back and forth with them among the people. Jesus was there for the Feast of Tabernacles, and in the middle of the week is when he went into the temple, and then it seems as though um, whatever happens, he gets a lot of grief from the religious leaders and the Pharisees. So that sort of carries through ch the rest of chapter 7. Um, and I want to read the last verse of chapter 7, and then we'll go into chapter 8. And we're going to look at the, the story of the woman caught in adultery this week. But the last verse of chapter 7 says this, chapter 7, verse 53. After this happened, and everyone went to his own house. So after this, everybody left. Remember, he's in Jerusalem. Um, everybody left and went to their own house. And it says, but now, you know, Jesus is from Galilee, 80 miles north. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So either nobody invited him to stay with them, or, and I think this was probably it, Jesus really was wise in using his time and wanted to get away in solitude, to pray, to, to rest, to seek his father's face. Um, it was his habit, wasn't it, to go away after ministering all day and ministering sometimes all night and all day. Um, and so it says this in verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The first thing I see in this is early in the morning. You never hear of Je Jesus is always either up all night or he starts early in the morning. You never hear anything about him. You never think of the disciples saying at 11, 12 o'clock during the day, hey, Jesus, we better get going. He was always early, up early in the morning. His time was very precious. Um, and it says he sat down and taught them. He taught them at the temple. So what did he teach? Well, it doesn't really say what he taught, does it? Um, at, the, at this point, the religious leaders are sort of leaving him alone a little bit. And I guess what he was probably teaching is the prophets and teaching perhaps some, the scriptures relating to the Messiah himself. And he was, but I like the fact that he was teaching them. He sat down with the people. I would have loved to have been in one of those Bible studies with Jesus, you know. Then we would really know, wouldn't we? <laughs> Instead of people standing up like me and others, that you have to say, okay, is that, is that right? Is that true? You know. Um, and verse 3 says this, Then the scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> see, they went away for a while, but here they're back. Here they're back, right? 
Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, so they bring her in, embarrassing her and everything. They set her in the middle of all of these people. They don't care. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. In the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such, such as her, this worthless person, not important like me, that such as her should be stoned and put to death. But what do you say? Uh, it's a little trap, isn't it? What do you say? You know, they were right. Leviticus 20 does say um, that if a man is, commits adultery with a woman, that they're to be brought out. And the adulterer and the adulteress are to be stoned. To commit adultery, you need two people. Amen? You need two people. It's, and it says they should be put to death. But evidently in this, uh, the man is not being charged. I sort of believe that it was a setup. It was a setup. And we'll see why. Because it takes two witnesses Two witnesses, in, in any capital punishment crime in the Levitical law, it takes two reputable witnesses to bring a charge. So you can see how that would be difficult, unless it was something that, hey, this is what's going on, let's use this, right? I think this woman is a pawn. They say this woman, they don't even include uh, the man. And, and I'm thinking maybe this guy was even part of the plan, you know? part of the plan and they let him go you know I was reading when I read this I thought of something you know you hear of these honor killings today mostly and exclusively in the Muslim religion honor killings it's been recorded in 11 countries and in the United States too I mean haven't you guys heard of a few shocking things where some folks will kill their daughter or, or somebody because of they brought dishonor on the family so I looked it up a little bit, and it's just heart-wrenching. It's over 900 recorded instances of honor killings in, the middle, in, in Jordan, actually. One of them, a few years ago, was a 13-year-old girl. She was raped by three men. She went to her parents and her family and told them, you know what they did? They said she must have seduced them. The family took the daughter and... They actually dug that hole up to her neck in a coliseum, and a thousand people witnessed her being stoned to death. A 13 year old girl. And then their honor was restored, it says. Another one, a brother raped his sister. Three times she got pregnant. The family had her. Here's what happened the family said she seduced, he seduced, uh, she seduced him. So the family, another brother, they tied her to a chair and they gave her an option of either be, have her throat slit or drink poison. And she drank the poison. This is, this is just cruel punishment. And this is what we see here with this woman, I think. We see somebody being a pawn, becoming a pawn in what's going on here. And you know, in the commentaries and all, it says that stoning for adultery was very rare in Israel because there had to be two witnesses, two reputable witnesses. So it wasn't something, you know, that happened a lot. But verse 6 says this, This they said, you know, she should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that, he, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They're always looking to catch Jesus, aren't they? Now look, if he had said, said okay, we're going to stone her, you know what would have happened? Well, it was illegal for them to stone her. The Romans forbid any death penalty for any religious reason. They could kill you, but they didn't allow the Jewish leaders and all to use a death penalty in anything relating to their religion. So they knew that if Jesus said, yeah, stone her, he'd be in trouble with the Romans, right? But if he said, let her go, all of a sudden, here's Jesus. First of all, he heals people on the Sabbath. He always, already doesn't pay attention to the law of Moses. He's already breaking the law. That's why they wanted to kill him. And here, now, if he was soft on it, 
they could say, and now a, a, a woman caught in adultery, and he's going to let her go also? See, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even keep the law that was given by Moses. So how is he the Messiah or even a prophet? And so they had, they had their little traps out there, you know. <clears throat> but you know what? Jesus' wisdom is just too much for them. He knows too much. He's, he's Jesus, right? If you remember when they brought him the coin, you know, and said, should we pay taxes? And he said, let me see a coin. And he, and they, and he said to them, whose face is on it? Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God, right? I mean, that's, man, that is a neat answer. You know, what, what else could you say? Well, yeah, you should pay taxes, but, the, you know, no, he just said, hey, because we know everything is God's, right? But Caesar's face was on it. What about the time when, when the religious leaders came to him and said, or they said to him, by what authority are you doing this, Jesus? What authority are you doing this? And he said, let me ask you a question. And if you can answer my question, I'll tell you. Was the baptism of John from God or from men? Well, they knew that if they said it was from men, right, the people loved John and they actually considered him a prophet. Many of the Pharisees went to John, didn't they? But if he had said, if they had said from God, Jesus would have said, then why didn't you do what he said? That he's the one that was the forerunner to me and said, I'm the Messiah. But you see, Jesus said that to him. You know what they said back? So, uh, so Jesus says to them, so which one is it? Is, is, was John's baptism from God or from men? And they said, well, we don't know, right? And he said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do things. Boom, right? Jesus didn't mess around, you know? It reminds me of the story with Solomon, with the, two ba with the baby, remembering the two women? Who could think of something that, other than to say, well, cut the baby in half. Give half to each. You know the real mother's going to say, no, let her have them. The wisdom of God. So, Jesus doesn't tell them, you know. And it says this. He doesn't answer them like that, but he says this in the last part of verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear. So he totally ignores the, the question. <clears throat> now, here's what it says. It doesn't tell us what was written, does it? And we speculate and we say, well, it might have been this, might have been some names of some people that these guys would recognize, or might have been some sins they were guilty of and all that. But the bottom line is this, it doesn't say. So whenever something isn't said, we can't really know for sure what it was, so we think, okay, it's not that important. It, it isn't in there because it wasn't important what he wrote in the dirt, you know? He was just writing. It could have been a scripture verse, uh, something like that, you know? And verse 7 says this, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now here's the way that it worked. The witnesses that witness the capital act are supposed to be the ones to throw the first stones. If you're, if you're saying, I saw this person kill this person, and you're reputable, you're a reputable witness. When they did the stoning, the witnesses, the two witnesses, or however many it was, they're the ones that picked up the stones first, certifying this is true what I'm saying. And they're the ones that start the stoning. Then the others join in and stone the person until they're dead. So let him throw a stone at her first. And I think this, they knew that it wasn't being done according to the law. It wasn't being done correctly anyway, was it? And then in verse 8 it says, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So now he's doing it again. And it says in verse 9, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So the thing you notice about that is he wrote on the ground again, but it doesn't mention it. It says, but those who heard it, they're, they're going back to Jesus saying, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. So it's Jesus' words that's convicting them, not anything he's necessarily writing. 
Now I'm thinking that the witnesses are starting to have second thoughts. If this was a setup, the witnesses are having second thoughts. They're actually going to have to kill this woman. They're going to have to throw the stones. Here's this thing trying to get Jesus trapped, and all of a sudden it might become to where we actually have to say, we're the witnesses, that, and we certify it, and we're going to do this, right? In verse 10, when Jesus has, had raised himself up, he wasn't even looking at them. You know, he did this whole thing without really looking at them, just writing on the ground. And he said, and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. No one, Lord. Not rabbi. No one, rabbi. No one, teacher. No one, good man, whoever you are. Something happened, didn't it? She saw the way Jesus was. I'm sure she heard the stories and she knew who he was. And now she sees him and how he treats her. And she calls him Lord. Something changed in her from the time she was brought in and thrown down till this point here. And it's the same with us, isn't it? It's the same with us. Didn't Jesus come to us at some point? And we thought, Jesus, yeah, maybe he's God. Maybe this, maybe that. Then we get to that point where he forgives us and we, we know it and we believe it and we call him Lord. It's the same with us. You know, the scripture says, the goodness of God leads to repentance. The goodness of God. God draws people by, with cords of love. He draws people with love. He convicts you and corrects you, and there's times for that. But God draws people. Jesus was drawing her with love. You know, she didn't deny it, did she? She didn't go up there and say, hey, wait a minute. No, no, no. Hey, where's the guy at? No, I didn't do this. They're setting me up. No, she didn't deny it. She didn't claim innocence. She didn't say it wasn't her fault. None of that stuff. She doesn't even speak that we know of until she calls him Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. You know, he was the only one that had a right to throw a stone, wasn't he? In all reality, Jesus was the only one who could honestly judge her and throw a stone. And you know what? She should have been stoned. And the man should have been stoned also. That was the Levitical law. It should have happened. But you know what? Jesus brought his cross, his cross to bear between the Levitical law and this woman. He brought his cross and said, I'll take it. Now she doesn't know that yet. But Jesus is making the decision, yes, I'm going to take that sin that she committed. Another stone on my back of the weight of the sin of the world. I'm going to pay for it. So Jesus had the right to have her stoned, but he also had the choice of putting his cross between that Levitical law and this woman who was a sinner just like all of us. Just like all of us. You know... We like that part, don't we? We like the part where he says, neither do I condemn you. But what about the next part? Go and sin no more. And what he means by that is, don't continue in sin. Not st struggles, not stumblings, not those things where your heart is to do the right thing and you stumble and struggle and, and we still have this flesh and we still have this fallen world. He's not saying that. He's saying, going, don't continue in sin. Don't continue in sin. Remember the lame man at the pool of Bethesda? We were talking about him before and how Jesus found him in the temple. And he found him, and remember the guy didn't even know who he was at first because they asked him, who was it that healed you? And he said, I don't know. But now he knows because after this, he went to the Pharisees and all and the high priests and told them who it was. It was Jesus. But remember what Jesus said to him? He said, you've been made well. 
Now go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. A worse thing. And we don't like that. We don't like that part where a worse thing can come upon us. But it can. And what could have been worse than lying in a bed for 38 years, crippled? I'll tell you what could be worse is separation from God forever. Of wasting your life and waking up in eternity and realizing, I rejected him. It says, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. So keep that in balance with how we live, right? See, we have cheap grace sometimes. We have cheap grace. See, it cost us nothing at the cross, did it? It cost us nothing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. We didn't add anything but our sin to all that he did on the cross, you know. But we can have a cheap grace. Yeah, God forgives us. So we, you know, I remember my son, I might have, I think I've shared this either in a Sunday school or something, but my son's 44 now, and, um, but I remember when he was like seven or eight, and we used to go to 7-Eleven, and I'd get him a Slurpee, and he'd eat the Slurpee, right? And one day, he did some work for some neighbor or something, I forget what it was, but they gave him five dollars, and he had a five dollar bill, and I remember him saying, hey, dad, look, I got five dollars, and I said, hey, pal, let's go to 7-Eleven now, you can buy me a Slurpee. He said, oh, dad, my five dollars isn't like your five dollars. Mine's different, right? You know why? He worked for it. It cost him something. It cost him something to get that $5. And he wasn't going to spend it on me, right? I'm supposed to be buying the Slurpees, right? But that's how it was. It cost us nothing at the cross. But we don't want to belittle or minimize what it cost him. You know? What it cost Jesus. Do we cheapen his grace because we're not the ones paying the debt for what we do, for how we live, for what we say, how we act, the things we're caught up in? Do we write them off to him? Sorry, Jesus. Sorry, Jesus. Sorry, Jesus. Romans 6 says this, when Paul was saying, should we sin that grace can abound? so that people can see how much God loves them by looking at us and seeing how messed up we are and how we're always rebelling and all, and God still forgives us. Should we sin so that we can show God's grace abounding? God forbid. God forbid we do that. God forbid. You know, sometimes I, I look on Facebook and you come across things like um, Jesus hung around drunkards and prostitutes and, and all this, and that's true. But sometimes we can, it can be skewed just a little bit like, oh, he, you know, don't worry about how you are. Jesus hung around drunks and prostitutes and murderers and tax collectors and dishonest people and all that kind of stuff. But why? Why did he hang around them? Let's look at Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. Jesus is teaching all the time. He's teaching again. And he passed by, as he passed by, the, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office as a tax collector. We don't like him nowadays, do we? I struggle with that even now. <laughs> Can they be forgiven? <laughs> Especially with, when you had a business. Um, but it says here, um, tax collector, um, and it says, now it happened. Oh, no, wait, it says, um, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining at Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and the disciples. Listen, for there were many, and they followed him. They were followers. Yeah, they were alcoholics, drunkards, they were prostitutes, they were tax collectors and all that, but they were following him, right? That's what it says, doesn't it? And they followed him. But when the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? 
There wasn't a doubt he was eating with them. There wasn't a doubt they were hanging with them, right? But when Jesus heard it, verse 17, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I didn't, oh, listen to this, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? To repentance. They were hanging with him. He was allowing them to be with him, to follow him. They were following him, and he was teaching them. You know why? To bring them through that. So they lay aside those sins and those weights that easily beset them and run that race that is set before them. He's doing it to save them, to, to sanctify them, to give them wisdom in how to walk and to how to be like him. So he says he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Whenever you hang around or see people, people come to church. Everybody is, is at a certain place. This is where they need to be, isn't it? They need to be loved by you guys. They need to hear the word, hopefully, and the truth. They need, they need to be shown there's a better way, you know? But never justifying what they're doing. He, you know, Jesus didn't hang around sinners to join them or to affirm them or anything like that. He hung around them to change them, to change them. And it's all of us throughout our lives. We're never going to get to that place where we can say, oh, finally I'm here. You know, I had a guy that um, I went to church with about 30, 40 years ago. And I might have shared this, I don't know. Just remind me. Um, but my personality, I'm just extroverted, you know. But I remember I knew him for a couple of years, and I remember him saying to me, Jimmy, I can't wait till I get to the place as a Christian where I don't have any more problems like you. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. His name was Jim too, right? And I'm like, what? He said, yeah, man, you're always happy. You're always, you know, and I said, whoa, whoa. Come home with me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Bottom line is, no, that's my personality and all that. And so, but he thought, you know, I'm gonna get, he's going to get to that place. And I said, no, Jim, you know, we're constantly growing and learning. We're constantly maturing. And God's maturing us and, and we become more and more obedient, hopefully, you know. But we, we might not, we're not going to get there in this life totally, Hopefully he, you know, he remembers that today. In verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, listen closely here, shall not walk in darkness, but have, have the light of life. Now, <clears throat> this is, can be both a promise, he who follows me, shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. It can be a promise or it can be a command. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness because they'll have the light of life. See the difference? Go and sin no more. He had just told that to the woman, didn't he? And perhaps on this he's saying to those around, if you're following me, don't walk in darkness. Don't stay in darkness. Don't have a lifestyle of darkness. Don't have a pet sin or something like that as a Christian and then justify it. 1 John 1 says this. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message which you have heard from him and, I, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's the promise. We don't do it perfectly, but our heart is set Lord, is there anything in my life that's separating me from you? Is there anything that's, that's causing my relationship with you to not be as precious and as soft and as intimate as it could be? If there is, please, don't let me be blinded. Don't let me be blinded in any way. So let me just end with three little things that I take from this. First one is this. Don't abuse the grace of God. 
Don't abuse. It's an unlimited supply. We know that. We know it's unlimited. He said it. It's unlimited. But we need to appreciate the fact that he lets us know that. But you know what? Sometimes we waste things that we have in abundance, don't we? We waste things. I remember when I had the glass shop, and, and I had glass cutters, right? Cut glass, of course. And I remember I had them all over. Had them in my truck, had them in my toolbox, had them in my pocket, had them at the shop. I went to a job about 50 miles away. I had to put a glass in this commercial building, and I ordered the glass wrong, and it was a little too big, and I had to cut <clears throat> about a half inch off the bottom of this thing. <clears throat> so I go in my truck, and I'm looking for a glass cutter, a glass cutter. Uh-oh, I don't see one in my toolbox. None of my pockets. Oh, man, glove box, round the floor, back of the bed. Like, Lord, I just need one glass cutter, one glass cutter. And the ones I got were not the ones you buy in the store. They were more expensive. And I'm 50 miles from home, and I'm like, I can't believe I did not think of making sure I have a glass cutter for this job. And I had to go back and, well, actually what I did is I drove back about 25 miles, and I saw a hardware store, and I went in, and they had these cheap little $5 green glass cutters, you know, steel wheels and all that. And I bought that, and I went back, and I was scared that I was going to break the glass because the thing was so cheap, and it worked out okay. But the bottom line is this. We can't do that with his grace. We can't say, oh, God, yeah, he's going to, take, he's going to forgive me. He's, he's going to let me keep going on with this. He's going to do this kind of thing, you know, and get content in our sin. We can't be content. Yeah, you know why? Because he'll forgive us. Oh, he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. You know that thing? Do it today. He'll forgive you. You know that thing? Do it tomorrow. He'll forgive you. You know that thing week after week? You know what happens? Your heart gets hard. Oh, his grace is there. But it comes to the place where now you don't even pray. I heard a pastor say one time, always thank God for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you feel his conviction, if anything in your life you have questions, the Bible says whatever's not of faith is sin. If there's anything in your life that you can't honestly say, God, I know this is okay. I know, Lord, you, you know, I'm, I'm at peace with you in this. Then just go to him and say, Lord, help me with this. Help me. But don't allow your heart to become hardened because the grace is there. And the second thing is this. Don't justify a sinful habit. Just don't, ju practical stuff. Don't justify a sinful habit. Don't justify a sinful hobby. Don't justify a sinful hobby. Don't justify a sinful lifestyle. Anything from the smallest to the greatest. Don't figure a way to make it, you know. My dad was like that. So people say, my dad was like that. My mom was like that. Oh, yeah, I'm really, you know, I really get irritated with people easy because that's, that's just how I am. Well, let God change us. Let him change us. Why did God make me this way? No, God didn't. Adam contributed that part. The fallen nature, the fallen world, Adam contributed his part. God saw us and said, I love you still, and I'm going to save you. But please be obedient. Please believe me and trust me. And the third thing is this. I'll finish with this. Remember this. Jesus is worth so much more than anything the world can give us. Jesus is worth so much more than anything the flesh can give us. Any pleasure, anything, he's worth more than all of that. And Jesus, and, and he can give us more than anything Satan tries to offer us. Anything. I think of this scripture once again, just lay aside the weight and the sin that easily besets you and run the race that's set before you. And I think this, we're reading in Revelation this morning in John's Sunday school class. And I just want to read it real quick. Um, because right now we don't see it yet. Um, but the day's going to come when all of us are going to stand before God. All of us are going to stand before God. And here's what it says when John saw Jesus. Chapter 1, then I turned, I didn't put this scripture in there, John, sorry. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, whoops, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
and in the midst of them, the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth. In the next chapter, it tells us that was the, the angel, the pastors, seven the churches. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, that's his word, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, John, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who laid his his head on his his chest, the one who was with Jesus when he raised Jairus' daughter and and, and Lazarus and and on the, the transfiguration and at the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the three. This is John. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That's when you see your sin. We're going to see it when we stand before him. We're going to know when we see him, Lord, like Peter, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm not worthy. He laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. We'll hear that also, won't we? Don't be afraid, Jimmy. I know you messed up, but I I saved you, and I forgave you, and I've made you my righteousness in Christ in me. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and to hell. Look, we serve a God that we cannot comprehend. His ways are not our ways. His ways are past finding out. We try to find them out. Of course, we study and we look. And, uh, but then we have to say, Lord, only you. You're above and outside and beyond all of this. Your word says, you thought I was such as you are, like a man, but he's not. So all I want to say and encourage you with this and encourage myself is this. As we walk, let's not abuse, let's not neglect the things God's called us to. We have one chance here in this life to walk worthy of the calling. We have one chance, the time that we have, to be obedient, to be obedient in this life. Because once, bam, that hits That's it. We're in eternity. And so I just want to encourage you today, and it's the same thing I try to encourage myself with all the time. I just had a birthday. I'm 69 years old, and I'm thinking, wow, where'd the time go? But Lord, I know my time is shorter than when I first believed, like your word says. Now it is nearer than when you first believed. But here's what I want. Help me, Lord, to finish well. From this day, Lord, help me to lay aside the weight and the sin that easily besets me. Help me, Lord, to say, wait a minute, I could be gone next week. I could be gone today. I could be gone next year. Who knows? The Lord could come back. But don't we want to stand before, you, before him and, and just say, Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy and your forgiveness. Let's not abuse it. Let's just make a recommitment to say, Lord, I want to finish well. No matter if you're a young person or you're older like me, you know, Ask God, help me to finish well so that we're not embarrassed and we're not ashamed on that day that we stand before him. And you know what? And we have those gifts, that treasure that we've laid up in heaven and those crowns that we can throw at his feet because he's worthy, isn't he? Father, we thank you. Lord, I know as I look out at people here, Lord, I know know them, most of them, and their heart for you, Lord, I just see that their love for you, their commitment and all, but Lord, I do pray that if anybody's here that's struggling, that, or, or Lord, they're caught in something they, they can't get out of, just pray, Lord, that you would come alongside them. You'd give them that grace and strength and power as they lean into you and rest in you, Lord, to lay aside those weights and those sins. Help us, Lord, to see the day we're living in. Help us to see, Lord, it's getting darker and darker, as your word said it would. And Lord, we pray this, that you said, if I come back, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Lord, that's such a strong statement. But Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to finish well. Help us, Lord, to set our, our face like flint towards heaven as you did towards Jerusalem. 
And Lord, help us not to be ashamed on that day and say, I wish I'd have done this and I wish I'd have done that. Lord, have your way in us. Just pray that you would just be with us this week. We pray that you'd give us boldness once again. Um, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom and that you'd give us another opportunity to share your love with somebody who doesn't know you this week. And if, Lord, if there's anyone here that is struggling and need prayer, I pray you put it on their heart to come up and speak to me after the service. Lord, and pray with them or speak with them, Lord. But, Father, that you would be glorified in everything that goes on in us, Lord. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a good week.